Let's turn to the Lord in prayer this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you, God, as we prepare our hearts, Heavenly Father, as we sang words to you that we mean to tell you that we love you, God, that we need you. Lord, words that even in the smallest way can express the deepest uh, images of who you are, God. The words can't comprehend. Words are in, uh, unable in themselves to say who you are. But we say you are our God and we love you. So we pray this morning now as, as your words opened up that you speak to us, God. Help us and guide us in all your truth. And we just ask all this, God. We pray that you would knock down walls if we're unable to receive this word or a veil that we can't understand this word. God, that you would provide a way, that you would go before us, Heavenly Father, God, like a mighty wind. Refresh us this morning. By your word, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. And if there's anyone here for Sunday school, now would be the time to go or in, um, also that, uh, um, that we have... Uh, Nursery is open as well. I thought it was very interesting, um, that last song that we sang, there's a book that was written of Puritan play, uh, prayers called Valley of Vision, and it's a great collection of Purity, Puritan prayers, and that song came from that book of the Valley of Vision. And um, it is easy for us to... Um, enjoy God and to enjoy each other when we're on the mountaintops of our lives. When there's experiences that we just feel like things are going so well. And, and that song just reminded me about how much growth for the individual Christian is when we find ourselves in the valleys of life and how much we need each other during those times. I think it's so important as I've been reflecting, we're, believe it or not, we're almost done with the book of Romans. And, and I constantly think about me personally, I don't know about you, but how beneficial the book of Romans has been personally to my life. When I think about this magnum opus, which he's called it, the doctrines of faith, I just think about how important this gospel really is. And and as we see in chapter 1, it is really the power of God. And, and what really focused my mind as a church, we're trying to think how do we lead people in the, to the, in the knowledge and teach the Bible and all of these things. He's telling us that it's the power of God through the preaching of the gospel that saves. It's not up to us. Just up to be, us to be faithful and obedient to who, what he's called us to do. But this is the trend throughout all Romans. And, and he's teach us these deep things. What has God done for the sinner? And, and how is it that the redeemed people of God are to live together, to respond just in life in general, whether it be to the governor authorities or to people who are unbelievers, to the church itself, how we're to use our gifts. And again, we've been in two chapters now, uh, 14, and we're going to be getting in 15 this morning about how is it not only that we get along. Because someone could say is, you know, I, I, I've experienced this in my life, you know, the church, <laughs> why do they do this to each other? Why do we beat each other up? In fact, last week it was really clear we are not to put a stumbling block or a hindrance for someone in their personal growth with God. Rather, we're to come alongside. And again, this is where we're going this morning in um, Romans 15. And, and so uh, the idea this morning, I titled the message, The Church, because really that's who he's originally writing to the church in Rome, both Jew and Gentile, and now um, to, for us. It's been preserved, it's been God-breathed for us to learn as well. So that's the title of my message this morning. So we're going to get right after it this morning. If you could stand with me for the reading of God's Word. Romans 15, we're just going to do seven verses this morning.
Romans 15, beginning in verse 1. We who are strong have an obligation to bear with the failings of the weak, not to please ourselves. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good to build him up. For Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. For whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction, that through the endurance and through the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accord with Christ Jesus, that together you may with one voice glorify the God, the Father of our Lord, Jesus Christ. Therefore, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. Heavenly Father, we just pray right now, God, and ask for your help. Lord, that you would do a work in us, Lord God, that today with one voice would respond to the power and the glory of you. So, Heavenly Father, we pray, let your word cultivate our hearts, drop seed, harvest seed. Heavenly Father, may your work be done here this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. So, I was thinking a lot about the idea of the church and all these things that uh, were to um, glean from the scriptures, to understand about the scriptures, not merely of just coexisting, how to get along, but really, what would the testimony of the church look like if we did certain things, if we were to bear with one another's failings, where we were to build each other up, um, that we would um, glean from the scriptures and submit ourselves to them, that through those scriptures and by the power of God that we could with one voice glorify him as a church. That's my prayer for all of us. That if there's anything that we can do, and I'm not speaking pragmatically, that we could glorify God. And we could help each other in that journey to glorify God. There was a book, uh, there's actually some curriculum, but there was a book written about the church, and the author was Jeffrey Johnson. And he writes this, he, in, he says, first and foremost, as a definition, to make a definition of the church, he said it's God's unified communion God's unified communion think about this as we gather we gather because he's called us to gather it's God's unified communion what we're experiencing here this morning is God's unified communion and and we know that um, the first person to even use the idea of church and the word church was Jesus Christ himself in Matthew 16, 18, remember when Jesus was asking his disciples, says, who do they say I am? And, and they're saying that you're a prophet and all these things. And then Peter, being Peter, he says, you are the Christ. And, and it goes on to say this in Matthew 16, 18, and I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Through Christ, both the profession of faith, the acknowledgement of who Christ is in the possession and to the family of God, that's who the church is. And the church will be built on the foundation of Christ through that profession and proclamation of the gospel, which then the Lord instructed the gathering of his people for the purpose of worship, for the purpose of ordinance, and for the purpose of equipping to gather. A gathering that as we see in Romans 12, 1, that would be pleasing to the Lord. And, and we gather because of the mercies of God. And understanding this gathering is because there was a, a wrath of God that was to be held. And in the mercies of God is that he pardoned. He took away that wrath and put it on his son. So we come together as living sacrifices for him. To glorify him to worship him, to remember him. This is who the church is. This is who the church is in Rome, in which Paul was writing, and also who we are today. The worship is a vertical focus act, a God-exalting act. And, and that's what we have here when we sing to him and we're speaking to him the truths of who he is. 
It's vertical focus. We're not thinking about ourselves. We're just thinking of one. My heart and my prayer is, you know, when we're singing and we're doing these things, you weren't thinking about what you were going to be making for the Super Bowl. But you'd be thinking about a God who gave it all. A God who left heaven and came to earth. A God who was born of a babe in a manger. A God that would be a lamb, an atonement for our sin. This is the living sacrifice that we're to live. This is who the church is. And that exercise of this faith that we have, we exercise within each other as a body. Does that make sense? That we, we live it out together. We're all in it together. I love that feeling. That I need you. And you need me. We need each other. You could look at the person to the left or the right and say, you know what? I need you. Because there's going to be times. There's going to be weak moments in life. There's going to be valleys that we sang about. There's going to be valleys in life that will put your faith to the test. That God has not abandoned you. God will redeem you. God will rescue you. God will do all that he said he's going to do. And we learn these things from valleys. And you get this picture in Acts about the church and Acts chapter 2, 42 to 47. It says, and they devoted themselves. This is the church. They devoted themselves to what the apostles teaching. That, that the word of God would become central in their life. That all that they were to do, that they weren't being legalistic or pharisaical, though they say that God's way is better. And as I follow God, I can keep my heart pure to him. And so they devoted themselves. There was a heart affection for the word. And it says, and the fellowship. That not only to God, but to each other. To the breaking of bread, remembering, ordinance. We're an ordinance covenant people. We're a people bound by the ordinances of Christ. He said, remember me. And we're an ordinance covenant people to the breaking of bread and the prayers. Calling out to God as a people with one voice, he says in Romans 15. It says, in an R and upon every soul came upon every soul. And many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had a need. And day to day, attending the temple together, breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those being saved. What a picture for us that we see in the early church First, it was a vertical focus to God through his word and his teaching. It means something for us. This is what he's trying to say. But this is the scriptures that he's left for you. It means something for you. It's a benefit for you. It's a profit for you. It's, it's something for you so you can stay the course, that you can run the race, that you can do this life in honoring God as a living sacrifice without compromise because you're strengthened and forged by the word. And you know what's really interesting about this? They use the word and. They keep adding to it. And they devoted themselves. And the fellowship. And an awe came over every soul. And all who believed were together. Do You see, it's not just a collection of gathering now, but they even took it into their homes. They bared one another's burdens. When people had a need, what did they do? They met the need. And, and it was that, through that picture, through that lifestyle, through that Christian life, the church itself, people around it was a witness that they were being saved day by day. And the Lord was doing it. They weren't doing it. They weren't feeding people for the sake of feeding people. They were, anyone who had a need, they were feeding people because their focus was vertical. They were doing it because the Lord himself commanded. And that great love for God flowed into the people that they met. 
And day by day, people were coming to be saved. Why? Because true, genuine love is pictured in Jesus Christ. We are such a bad picture of what that love looks like. In fact, a lot of our love is conditional. When things are going well, when people listen, whether it be our kids or our neighbors or our co-workers, it's easy to love them. No, there is a love that goes beyond measure. And, and in this, the church is to be the picture, the witness, and the ambassador representing this type of love to the world around us. So the Apostle Paul here in Romans 15 wants to bring out some characteristics for this church. And there's a lot of them that you can come up with. So this morning I want to tunnel in on six characteristics of what this looks like. Because a lot of time that's the question we ask. Someone would say, boy, really true love? What does that really look like? Truth. Absolute truth. What does that really look like? So he's given this for them and for us. Here's the first one. And what's amazing to me, my mind was a swirl this morning upstairs in Genesis. These words were used upstairs this morning. I got to tell you, Genesis to Revelation, the Bible is consistent in its teaching to God and the way that we to live with each other. First is this, our obligation, our obligation to bear with. And we get it right from the text, Romans 15, 1. We who are strong have an obligation to bear with the failings of the weak and not of ourselves. The Apostle Paul here is placing himself in the language and the personal pronouns. He's making himself strong here. We who are strong. He's making himself as one of these strong. And again, we've already talked about this in, in chapter 14, right? The, the, they were talking about the weak and the strong. And last week we even said this, that we could find the weak and the strong in one individual. There's times when you're strong about the Bible. You have convictions about the way of the Lord. And there's some things in your life that you might be weak in. You might say, you know, I struggle with this. I constantly struggle with this. And, and so here he is making himself among the strong. And so in the context of uh, the Roman church, we know that it was probably predominantly Gentile. So there's Jew and Gentile to together to live in harmony. And, and this is about the failings of the weak. But we're obligated. The most important responsibility for pleasing one another, pleasing God and one another, falls, number one on this, all believers. He's writing this to the church. He didn't write Romans to the pastor of the church in Romans. This would be read to the Roman church for all believers. That there's an obligation that we have. And if you were in Romans this morning, we see the obligation and the, the initiative of, of a covenant with Adam. And you see that there was an obligation. See, this is, we don't like this word in this culture. We don't want to be obligated to anything. Marriage, job, I can go down the list. This is against, this is almost culturally counter the idea of being obligated to himself. But yet we see in the early church in Acts 2 that they were. They were obligated to each other. They met. They worshipped together. They ate together. And if we really want to truly please God, we believe in the one who fulfilled that covenant, our second Adam. And as we see how this text unfold, here's the word obligation. For all of you people that love Greek, I know you love it. The obligation is the word aphelio. Your Bible might have said, might not have said obligation. It might have said ought. I don't know what version you're reading from. It could have said that we were ought to bear with them. Same word, aphelio. And, and here's the idea. The idea of this word is owing a debt. The, the word here used, this obligation or ought to, it means there's an indebtedness that we have to Christ and to one another in the congregation of the saints. There's a, something that's an activity that happens within the church that speaks of an indebtedness we have to Christ. And the fact that Christ died for every one of you, he went to the cross 
for you. He saved you. We have an indebtedness to one another because of Christ. Does that make sense? A filio is the word. Look at what, and, and I love 1 John because he writes a lot about this. 1 John 4.11, beloved, if God so loved us, we ought, a filio, to love one another. 1 John 2.6, 1 John 3.16, all say the same thing. In the church of Christ, there's an indebtedness to love the way that Christ loved. In the same way we are indebted to bear with, to bear one another's burdens. This is one of the great signs of a healthy church, by the way. It's not how many people come to the church. It's not how many people fill the seats. One of the healthy marks of a church that displays a clear, uh, unconditional indebtedness to each other in practical ways and practical life. See, this is not pragmatic. It's not a program. Romans 13, 8 says this, Owe no one anything except to love each other. For the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. This is the obligation. Do you feel obligated here? Do you feel like there's relationships that you've met here that have been so precious to you because they've walked through things that you've walked through? They've been there for you when you felt weak. And when you're strong, you've been able to come alongside others and do the same. This is what family's all about. This is what the church family's all about. And he's speaking of this here. And the word that we're to bear with, here's another Greek word for you, is bastezo. Refers to, and this word means this. It means to pick up or to carry. To carry a burden. To pick up. Someone's down, pick them up. You know what the picture I got? I got the picture of what, I, what was in my mind. I've been watching all these World War II shows because of my grandson. He's studying history and, and battles. And I get this picture of Normandy where the guys, the soldier, literally dropped his gun to pick up a soldier on his back, exposing himself totally to the enemy to carry his brother. That no one would be left behind. Here's the picture. The picture is that, you know, sometimes people are going to be weak. They're beaten up by the world. Maybe they're even doubting their own faith sometimes. No, it's time to put them on our back and carry them. When they're struggling, that we would pick up and carry. This is the word that's used here, the picture. But it could be more defining for you. I can think of Jesus Christ after his beating, carrying his cross. To Golgotha. He carried everything for the sake of being obedient to his father and for those sheep that he would call his own. That he'd do a work that you couldn't do. He carried it. He carried it to the end in completion. He carried it so much that, oh, he paid the heaviest price to have the wrath of God on him. You know what I also thought about? What Simon the Cyrene must have felt like when the Roman soldiers grabbed him and says, carry his cross, because Jesus was struggling so physically after being beaten, and Simon carried it for him. You know something? I've had times in my life where I'm weak. And people have carried me. There's times of you've been weak. And this is what we're to do with each other. This is how we're to respond to one another. You know, we don't always have to act like, oh, we got it all together. Like, we don't worry about anything. No. We can share. We can share our heart. It doesn't make us less. It makes me part of the family. It makes you part of the family where someone can come alongside and say, wait a minute, get on my back for a while. Get on my back for a while. You're struggling walking? Get on my back. I'll carry you. This is what, uh, in this verse, is coming to, coming to light. And it reminds me of what Jesus commanded to us. If we had to follow him, he says... 
We must deny ourselves. You know what? It might mean time. It might mean some levels of exposure to things. Whatever that is, like the soldier exposing himself to the enemy for the sake of another. He says, pick up your cross, bastizo, carry it daily and follow me. Beloved, we are obligated to pick up and carry for one another. What a picture of the church. It defines us who we are because Christ carried you and now we bear with one another in love and action. And it says to do this for the failings of the weak. And what was that? Well, what we learned earlier in 14, right, is that with Jew and the Gentile, people were celebrating feasts or it might have had to do with the diet because of their Jewish heritage, all these kind of weeks. But what could be the failings of the weak? You might have come here from a church that, man, you're learning more about the Bible now than you've ever learned. There might be a failings of the weak. It might be just Bible itself. You might have heard great messages about how to deal with your anxiety and all these things, but never really learning the author, the perfecter of faith. And, and sometimes it's that. Sometimes you're carrying things from the past. And we're to carry these things with you, help you. These are the failings of the weak. And the strong are indebted to carry them with you, strengthening one another. Can I tell you something? I said earlier on, this is for the entirety of the church. Let me just tell you something. When a friend comes to you and says, you know, I'm struggling with my own salvation. When they say that to you, you know what my prayer is? That you're willing to put them on your back and say, you know what, let's gather, let's come together, let's have coffee together once a week, once a month, whatever it is, and let's open up the word of God together because there's assurance in your salvation. Don't wait for us to have a evangelism class or a class or this or a class for something else. No, God put that person right in front of you. Don't pass it off to me. I'd gladly do it, but it's not meant for me. See, we're all in it together. Have you ever noticed my size? I don't know how many people I can carry. I'd have to get Tim and Jim and Bobby and all these people. They could carry a lot more than I could carry. But let me just tell you something. This is it. It's, it's, a respon it's an all responsibility because we have a God that gave it all. I love what Paul wrote to the church in Corinth. He wrote this in chapter 9 when he was dealing with these very same issues. Remember, Corinth was a mess. They were a mess. And he had addressed so many things in the first letter to Corinthians. This is verse 19 to 20 through, uh, 22. He's dealing with all these things. People who are holding to feast. People were doing this and that. He says, for though I am free from all, I have made myself a servant to all. He was willing to put these people on his back. That I might win more of them. To the Jews I became as a Jew in order to win Jews. To those under the law I became as under the law, though not being myself under the law. Can you see each step he's taking? That I might win those under the law. To those outside the law I became as one outside the law, not being outside the law of God, but under the law of Christ. Meaning to other Christians, Gentile Christians. His ministry was to the Gentiles. He'd put them on his back that he might th win those outside the law. To the weak, I became weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all people, that by all means I might save some. See, the kingdom of life, the kingdom life is other-centered. We are obligated, and we are to bear. It's interesting, isn't it? I think maybe I need to go to the gym so I could do more squats, so I could hold some people on my back. But I need you, and you need me. You need each other. This is the life. This is the church that he's talking about here in the examples in Christ. Second is this. Our responsibility is to build up. Romans 15, 2. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good to build him up. And again, once again... Dealing with the idea, the responsibility, the yes, we have Christian liberty in Christ, but some will be dealing with their own past 
And, and as in those things, we have a responsibility to build each other up, those that are weak. And the more that we do this, we will be setting aside our personal legitimate liberties for the sake of somebody else. And some of that is just time. You know that? Time is such high value. You all work a lot, have very busy lives. You think about setting aside a half hour or an hour to be with a brother or a sister. There's so many struggle that, you know, there's hard sayings in the Bible. Who's going to teach them if we don't? We need to be an army this way, by the way. We need to be an army this way. What a beautiful picture of the church. And we're to please his neighbor. The word please here is this. It gives you the idea to satisfy the needs of somebody else. To satisfy. And that comes two ways. The, the motivation for pleasing is twofold. First, the scripture tells us here, it is for his good. It's for their good that we uh, please them, that we satisfy their need by coming alongside them. I'm not talking about affirming sin. I'm not talking about any of those things. I'm talking about under the ordinate of Christ to be Christ for them, to pick them up, carry them, instruct them, help them, guide them. It's for their good. It brings them back. This is why sometimes, you know, we know that uh, God is sovereign over these things, but he lets us go our own way. Sometimes he wants us to be in that valley that we cannot do anything on our own, so we'll cry out to him. That's the picture of Israel in the Old Testament. And not only is it for his good, it's for his edification. That's the word to build up. It's for their edification that they would be lifted up, not you that they would be lifted up. This is exactly what he wrote about in Romans 14, 19. So then, let us pursue what makes for peace and mutual upbuilding. And as you read throughout all scripture, Jesus' life and ministry is laced with this. This is what Paul wrote to the church in Philippi. Uh, in Philippi. In the second chapter, 2 through 5, he says, Complete my joy by having the being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord of one mind. Have you ever shared your faith? Have you ever helped a brother or sister going through a difficult time? Isn't it like you have their same mind? Like you, you get to be in a place of brotherhood and sisterhood under Christ where you start thinking the same and you're doing it for their benefit and not for yours. It's like having that same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. It says, do nothing from selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. It is other-centered. Let each of you look not only on his own interests, but also on the interest of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. See, it's other-centered. Some would say, you know, um, there's, a, there's a lot of thought in the church today that, you know, Christ did all the work and we say amen. We know they did, but then you don't need to do anything. Paul is saying something here, so important for the life of the body of Christ. Whether you see it as a body and Christ is the head, or if you see it as a building and Christ is the chief cornerstone, everything is built off Christ and he is our example. And there's a responsibility we have to one another to edify our brothers and sisters in Christ. Not their sin, but to help them. To be other-centered, other-minded, other-loving. To build them up in the faith and life. The greatest example of that humility is Jesus Christ himself. He became a servant to all, even to those that reproached him. You know, we can fill our day with a lot of different things. But when Christ died in your place, he took you from a place of peril. And he did it without question. He was willing to carry the sin of the world, John the Baptist said, that we might be saved. He became a servant of all. Third, 
characteristic that we can see out of this. Our direction to follow the example of Christ himself. Uh, chapter 15, verse 3. For Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. We're to have this attitude of Christ and the perspective of Christ, a kingdom centered with a kingdom mind. Again, in Philippians, Paul writes, who though, in chapter 2, who though who was in the form of God did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking on the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of man. And being found in human form, he humbled himself, even becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Jesus left his glory, and he came in humiliation. He emptied himself, he denied himself any glory, and became a servant to all. He humbled himself to, to be a man, and was obedient to his Father in heaven. He became the atonement for sin, he became the Lamb of God to be slain. He became, not only that, but the propitiation, he, which only means this. He satisfied the wrath of God in your place. Meaning everything that he did, he did fully, so there was nothing left for you to atone for for yourself. When you stand before God someday and he calls you home, all that they will see is the work of Christ in you. The picture of the saving work of Christ. And man, all I have to say when I read this is hallelujah. Praise be to God. He satisfied the justice of God, the wrath of God by being put on a cross, pierced for our transgressions. He became the means of righteousness for the wicked. He was our substitute. The apostle Paul here, Interesting enough, goes back to the Old Testament scriptures. Psalm 69, 9. A Psalm of David. For the zeal for your house has consumed me, and the reproaches of those who reproach you have fallen on me. This was a reality in the life of King David. But how much more in Christ? For the zeal of the house of God, the reproach of sinful men, befell on Christ. He became a reproach. Isaiah says this in Isaiah 55, 3. He was despised and rejected by men. When we look at the supreme purpose of Christ's coming, it was to please and glorify his Father and to accomplish his will. To do everything that his Father had set for him to do. And his high priestly prayer says this. Before the cross, I have glorified you on earth. I've glorified you. I've made you known. To a people that were far from you, they didn't understand. But I made you known. I've accomplished the work that you have give, gave me to do. He called his sheep faithfully. He instructed. He taught. And he says, and now in his prayer, Father, glorify me. And your presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. Bringing back into perfect unity the work of Christ. Isn't it interesting if Christ is our example. The situation and what was before Christ was agonizing. The garden was agonizing. The thought of the cross was agonizing. And yet he was obedient. To the Father. Christ's example is what I call humble labor. And this labor is part of being for us the holy living sacrifice of Romans 12. A labor for our brothers and sisters in Christ to be active in love, to be active in caring, to labor, to pick up, to carry, to do all these things. Oh, imagine if we could learn this truth. You know what's surprising to me? You read Romans, you think, what, what else is there for to learn? I learned so much in these verses. I learned some of my weakness in these verses. I learned that there's times in my life where you feel like, man, I just want to shut my phone off. And yet, this labor for one another, for our brothers and sisters to be active in this love, 
to be responsive in this love is amazing what he's teaching us, the example of Christ, the labor for the lost. You know, sometimes we get frustrated. Sometimes we get downright angry because we've been praying for someone for a long time that doesn't know him. And we think that God's just not powerful enough to do it. We get frustrated. No. We're to be active. We're to be active with God because for Christ, he says, if you believe in me, you'll obey my commandments. It's not about rules. It's about wanting to satisfy and honor God with our lives as holy living sacrifices. And yes, that means to our brothers and sisters in Christ, it also means for the labor, for the lost. We are the proclaimers of the gospel. Labor that glorifies God so God would be made known. Do you know that your neighborhood needs to know? God needs to be made known. Do you know that your workplace needs to know? God needs to be made known. And let me just tell you, the church (laughs) needs the glory of God, God to be made known. Because when we do that, We'll cast away all the programs thinking we've got a program for God. No. God will show his glory. God will do a work. True revival will come. And I just think of Jesus Christ with the eternal proclamation upon the cross at Calvary. It is finished. finished because it's beginning in you. It's finished because you don't have to do it, but yet you're called to it. It's finished because God is satisfied and glorified. The fourth characteristic is this, our desire to submit to the instruction of the scriptures. Romans 15, 4 through 5. For whatever is written in the former days was written for our instruction through endurance and through encouragement of the scriptures that you might have hope. May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in harmony with one another according to Christ. What I loved about this, and we're going to talk more about this tonight, is what was written in the former days. The word of God, the instruction of the word of God. Can we just submit to the word of God? How am I supposed to handle stress? Go to the word of God. How am I supposed to love? Let me just go to the word of God. How am I supposed to, when I'm feeling anxious about things, how am I supposed to deal with this? Go to the word of God. How are we supposed to handle conflict? Let's go to the word of God. Isn't it amazing when we submit ourselves to the word of God and don't rebel against it and follow it, what difference it makes in the lives of people? Because one of the things it says here, the word of God is enduring. It's enduring. It lasts forever. It won't end. And through encouragement of the word in the scriptures, that's where we'll find our hope. We're not to segregate the word. All scripture is for us. The word is all God breathed. John writes this and the divinity of the, if its authorship. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God. And the word was God. It is the living word. God speaking to us. For what? Our instruction. We're meant to learn from it. You know I I think of when I've run into trouble. How I've turned away from the word of God. And not consulted the word of God. I don't know about you. But in the pastor epistles. Paul writes to Timothy. And says this in 2 Timothy 3.16. All scripture. Not just some of it. Not just little pieces of it that you like. He says, all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching. We're not to grow in the opinions or the subjective truths. We are supposed to grow in the objective truths by the word of God, not our experiences. We're not supposed to grow in self-realization. If I believe it, it can happen. The word of faith movement, it's a heresy. But our practice in life would be instructed by the word of God. He says, and by that, not a mere portion of scripture, but all of it. 
the teaching, if we submit to its divine authority, not because we have to, but because we want to, it'll be a profit to us. It's also a reproof. It can rebuke us, our theological errors and activities. Imagine when you're reading the Bible, we get confronted with the living God. And you say, you know, I've always believed this, but it says this. And how do I deal with these things? How do, I, how do I reconcile the word of God in my own life? How do I submit to it? See, this is what worship is. Worship is not singing the songs up here. Worship is when we hear God speak and we're willing to go prostrate before God and say, you are God. And I will follow. That's what worship is. And this is what he's speaking here. He's speaking that our worship, our desire should be God. And guess what? We could have some theological errors in our lives, in our activities. Proverbs 15, 5. A fool despises his father's instruction, but whoever heeds reproof is prudent. The word of God corrects us, trains us in righteousness. It, di it directs us to the ways of God. The word's also eternal. The text tells us here that through endurance, that the word of the Lord will stand from creation to restoration. Scripture says, not a jot or tittle will fall. The prophet Isaiah wrote this in 40, verse 8, the grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of God stands forever. Have you ever read the Bible? Have you ever put a burden on your heart, as God laid a burden on your heart, to open up the word of God and say, you know, I want to know you, God. Paul would say, in the power of your resurrection. More than that, they say, you know what, I'm going to submit my life to you now. I'm going to submit. You've saved me. Now I'm going to follow you. Part of following is following his word. Have you ever thought about doing that in your own life? This will be a great encouragement to your life. God will show up because his word's also unchangeable. I'm going to move quick here. See, the scriptures guides us into the truth and shapes our sanctification and our journey home. He does that for you. He does that for me. And when we struggle with the hard sayings in the Bible, we're here to carry one another, pick each other up, instruct, and teach. He goes on to say this in, verse, in uh, the fifth point, that with one voice glorify God, unity, that together we may with one voice glorify God, the Father of the Lord Jesus Christ, would have one voice, every tribe, tongue, and nation, one voice. When Paul, he encouraged the church in Ephesus to walk in a manner worthy of the gospel, to which you were called. Remember, you were called out of darkness and brought to his marvelous light. We need not stumble. The path is lit and his way is known. Follow it. And we're to follow. It goes on to say, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, having the attitude of Christ and the knowledge what he's done for you. Then it goes on to say, to eager to maintain, to maintain it. This is activity. This is labor the unity of the spirit, and the bond of peace. Verse 4, there is one body, one spirit, just as you were called to one hope. When Christ is the head and you follow him, and the scriptures are made known to you, and you, you're led by them, you'll find peace. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. Jesus is the way and the truth and the life. One God, Father, who is over all and through all and in all. With one voice, unity in the church is essential if God is to be glorified. Unity in the church is essential if God is to be glorified. One voice is the intimate relationship between God and his people through Jesus Christ. One voice is the proclamation of worship and submission of God's people to God. One voice is one family, locally and universally. It's who the church is. Then finally, I just want to end this. The church is God's unified communion, what I started with. Therefore, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. Who are we to cast someone out that Christ has redeemed? 
So if we were to sum everything up, what could we learn from a text like this? It's this. You ought to bear up, build up, follow up, submit to, and with all your life glorify God. This is what the community of believers are called. And you know, I, I always like to end with you some words from a hymn. But I hope what I'm going to do here today is not sacrilegious in any way. But a song entered my mind. And it wasn't a hymn. In fact, it's a secular song. But I want to read you some words to this. This song was actually written in 1969, a very uncertain time in our country. Our men and women were off in the Vietnam War and all these things are going on and people just didn't know how to deal with these things. And this group, this British group, wrote this song. And you might know it. The road is long with many a winding turn. And I can tell you, that's your life. Our journey with God is not a flat road. Sometimes it's hills, sometimes it's valley, sometimes it's wide. That leads us to who knows where. Who knows where? Well, in the church, we know where. That's why we're to carry one another. But I'm strong, strong enough to carry him because he ain't heavy. He's my brother. So we go. So on we go. His welfare is my concern. No burden is he to bear. We'll get there. For I know he would not encumber me. He ain't heavy. He's my brother. If there's any imagery I can give to you today, is there's someone in this room right now that might be hurting. That you might not feel you're strong enough. But if you think other scented, God will give you the strength to carry and carry on. Because I need you and you need me and we need each other. Because he isn't heavy or she isn't heavy. She's a brother and sister in Christ. I'm not saying there's anything theological in this song. There's not. The reality is though this is sort of what the Apostle Paul is saying for us. It requires activity. It requires the ability and discernment to know when it's time to carry. That someone else's welfare is a bigger concern than ours. And there, there is no burden too big for us to bear. Because guess what? We help him. We'll get there together. And in glory, we'll worship him. The lamb upon the throne. We'll worship him with our voices, with one voice. There's only one voice in heaven. Glory to the lamb that was slain. Worthy is he. So if there's anything to take from this, be open to the work of God in your own life. Be other-scented. Bear up. Build up. Follow up on the word. Follow Christ. And may his life and by the power of the Holy Spirit, transform you into the living sacrifice that God has called us to. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you, God, for your word is that lamp. It is the light. It is our hope. It is the future. Already, Heavenly Father, you get us to experience those great glories of heaven by worshiping you every Sunday morning, by meeting together in homes, caring for one another building one another up. Oh, Lord, is when we come together, the ordinances that we can remember who you are and all that you did on the cross on the behalf of sinful men. God, we just remember well here this morning. And we just ask, Lord God, help us be the church that you want us to be, Heavenly Father, that you would, through your design, through the word's design, not our own thoughts or opinions, God, that we could carry one another, especially the weak. Heavenly Father, we thank you, God. Your gospel is what gives life. Oh, there are people limping all around us, God. May your word go forth. And Lord, I pray if there's anyone here today that's seated there because they can no longer walk and they're struggling, Heavenly Father God. Maybe in their own faith. Maybe it's the assurance of their own faith. All these truths that we talk about, it's so easy to say it was good for them, but I don't know about me. Yes. If God has called you, 
There's assurance of salvation. He has made himself known. That we're to cry out to him. We're to call out to him and profess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord. You are our master. You are our carrier. You carried it. Now carry me. Heavenly Father, we pray right now. We ask, Heavenly Father, in your name. If there's someone here crying out to you this morning, Heavenly Father. We pray by your divine providence, God, that they might be healed. Lord, help us carry one another. Help us, Lord, be the church. So, Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you in Jesus' name.